Dover the Chair Slovenia. <laughs> Thank you very much for your invitation to speak in your culture centre in Ljubljana. I was last here in 1966. <laughs> and I am delighted to be back again. And I feel very much at home because I come from a country that I think may be slightly smaller than yours. And that is Northern Ireland. And I always feel as I travel around the world that there's a sympathy between people who come from small countries. But I'm not going to go into the difficulties associated with that philosophical concept. <laughs> and looking, I'm so encouraged to see so many of you here, which is a tribute to all the hard work that's been done by the organizers but is also an indication of the interest in these topics. And I discover virtually in every country I go to that similar audiences come. I'm certainly not like the bishop in England who was visiting a little country church on his annual visit. And as he climbed up into the pulpit, he noticed there were only three old people in the audience. And just behind him was the local a minister, and he whispered to him, and he said, did you tell them I was coming? And the local minister said, no, but word seems to have got around. So I'm delighted I'm not like that. And you've given me a very interesting title. And I'm grateful again to whoever translated the version of the talk that I sent in advance. What I say tonight will be similar and related, I hope. <laughs> but there is more in the little booklet that you have been given than I will be able to say. And that's a very good thing, because what I'm looking forward to tonight is the end of my talk and the opportunity to listen to your questions. That's always, for me, the most interesting part. So please do write your questions out, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can. The title you've given me is the Higgs boson, God of the Gaps. And for those of us in England, two weeks ago it was very exciting to learn that Peter Higgs had been awarded the Nobel Prize. Many years ago he predicted that there would be a special particle. And during the years afterwards, a lot of work has gone into, first of all, working out the mathematics and then using the vastly expensive instruments in CERN in Geneva, culminating in the discovery of the Higgs boson. It is a theme that is very up to date. This is Austria's leading weekly magazine. It appeared yesterday. And it was handed to me about an hour before I gave a lecture in the Technical University in Vienna. Schöpfung ohne Gott, creation without God, no question mark, no full stop. But it is about the Higgs boson. Interestingly, some people have called the Higgs boson the God particle. Professor Higgs does not like that description. And I don't like it either, and no serious scientist likes it. Professor Higgs is an atheist. I am a Christian believer. But we share that idea that calling it the God particle is actually very silly. It is a very exciting discovery. And as this article suggests, 
It's not the end of physics, it's the beginning of a new era in physics. As the last building block, so it is believed, fitting into the standard model and giving some kind of explanation of how it is that mass exists. Now, these concepts are extremely difficult. And I am not presuming that you know mathematics or physics. I speak to you as a pure mathematician. I did study theoretical physics at Cambridge many years ago. But what I want to do is to talk to you not about the details of the science, but about the implications and the conclusions that people are drawing from the science. And I hope that that's going to be accessible to everybody. Not long ago, I received an invitation to go to Geneva, to CERN, to engage with about 50 physicists who'd worked on the Higgs problem, mathematicians, philosophers, some theologians. And the idea was, can we find a language to talk to each other? Now, this is very interesting because it had never happened before. The director of CERN, who stayed for the whole conference, was interested in the philosophical and theological implications, if any, of this discovery. And we had a fascinating few days. And it was uh, rapidly perceived that although we all shared the same commitment to science, we had very different underlying worldviews. Now, in orientating ourselves in this debate, because the title of this magazine, Creation Without God, seems at least to remind us of a tension or a conflict that exists in many people's minds. Indeed, it is the title of my book, Has Science Buried God? I want to suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that there is a deeper question in a way. The conflict, and there is a real one, is not between science and belief in God. After all, we owe modern science to belief in God. That may surprise some of you. But it is the fact and is supported by many of my colleagues who are historians of science, that if you look at the 17th century and you think about science arising under people like Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and so on, they were all believers in God. And there is a connection, as was expressed by Alfred, Sir Alfred North Whitehead, the brilliant historian and philosopher of science. And summing up what he said, C.S. Lewis wrote, men became scientific. Why? Because they expected law in nature. And they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. That is, it was belief in God as the underlying worldview that was the motor that drove the rise of contemporary science. Let me put that in a slightly provocative way. I am not remotely ashamed to say to you tonight that I am both a scientist and a Christian because arguably Christianity gave me my subject. So what has happened in the meantime? Because behind our title the Higgs boson, God of the Gaps, is the contemporary feeling in the West and in the academy that somehow science and God don't belong together. Well, I want to suggest that they do belong together, but that the conflict, and there's a real conflict, is between two world views. You can see that. Peter Higgs, 
brilliant physicist, Nobel Prize winner 2013. He's an atheist. William Phillips, whom I met not long ago in Oxford, is a brilliant physicist too, Nobel Prize winner, and he's a Christian. Now that ought to tell us something. What does it tell us? It tells us that the real problem cannot lie between science and belief in God. No. The difference between those two distinguished Nobel Prize winners is not their science, it's their worldview. One is a Christian, a theist, who believes in God, and the other is an atheist. So the real question is, where does science sit? Does it really point towards atheism? Or does it, as Isaac Newton and Kepler and Galileo and Clark Maxwell believe, does it point towards God? And we can ask questions about the evidence for that as we go along. So I think we need to get rid of this idea that science and belief in God are in essential conflict. There are equally distinguished scientists in our world who are atheists and who are not atheists, who are theists. So that's the start of the situation. And it was very fascinating to me to engage in discussion with people who were actually involved in setting up the particle accelerator and in discovering the Higgs boson. And I'm going to share with you some things that scientists are saying. Now, Stephen Hawking is arguably the most famous living scientist. For many years, he left us in suspense. One didn't really know whether he left a little space for God or not, until recently, when he co-authored a book called The Grand Design with Leonard Mladenov, in which he clearly states his atheism. And it hit the headlines all around the world. Stephen Hawking says physics leaves no room for God, and so on. So, according to him, there's no space for God because the laws of physics are the real explanation of the existence of the universe. More recently, Lawrence Krauss, a professor of physics at Arizona State University, very well known for his book, A Universe from Nothing, and he was another of the participants at this conference, he, when he read about the Higgs, wrote an article in one of the British newspapers saying that the Higgs boson is arguably more important than God. And I was tempted and gave in to the temptation. I wrote a reply to that that appeared in the London Times, and you can see it on the Internet. The Higgs boson is arguably more important than God. Is that true? What could that kind of thing mean? Well, let's first look at the idea that stands behind it. As I travel around, particularly the West, I discover that in many universities and in the media and among the population, there is an impression that science is now the only way to truth. The only really reliable way to get knowledge about our world is through science. Now, science has an immense cultural authority, and rightly so. We are all so grateful. There might even be people sitting twittering and tweeting as I'm talking to them here on all these marvelous iPhones and everything else. We're all very grateful to science and technology. But it's very important, ladies and gentlemen, to realize that there is more to the world than science. You see, if you think that science is the only way to truth, you will go a step further 
and you will end up believing that science is coextensive with rationality. That is a fatal mistake. But let's look at the first thing. We call it scientism. Science is the only way to truth. Bertrand Russell, the famous philosopher and mathematician, put it this way. What science cannot tell us, mankind cannot know. That sounds very impressive. And he was a wonderful logician, but his logic left him at this point. Because, and I hope it's not too late at night for logic, ladies and gentlemen, because the statement, what science cannot tell us, mankind cannot know, is not a statement of science. So if it's true, you cannot know it's true. Have you got that? It's logically incoherent. It goes too far. And it was a Nobel Prize winner, Peter Medawar, in Oxford, who put the record straight by saying, there is no quicker way of bringing down criticism against science by claiming that science can answer every question. It is obvious that there are questions that science cannot touch. For instance, and he gave these examples, the simple questions of a child. Where did I come from? Where am I going to? What is the meaning of my life? And he said it's to literature and philosophy and religion that we must turn for answer to these things. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in a culture center tonight. If science is the only way to truth, you'd have to shut this place down. And you'd have to shut down half the faculties in your university. Where would history go? Anthropology, art, music, languages, literature, and so on. They would disappear. Einstein saw the point. And he put it this way. He said, you can speak of the ethical foundations of science, but you cannot speak of the scientific foundations of ethics. And he saw that you cannot answer ethical questions by science. Now, that's a huge contemporary debate, incidentally. But that's not the topic of my lecture tonight. But it's a very important one. Because there's such an ingrained impression that science is the only way to truth, that some people are now claiming, including Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, that science can solve the age-old ethical dilemma of David Hume. I don't think it can, but that would take us too far from our subject tonight. We want to get back, and I'm going to use Stephen Hawking because it's a very useful thing to do because his book is very clear about certain issues. He raises the interesting questions at the beginning of the book. How can we understand the world? What is the nature of reality? Where did it come from? Does the universe need a creator? And as you read it, and as I read it for the first time, I thought this is going to be very interesting to hear a world-class scientist address the big philosophical questions. But when I read about two sentences further, I got a shock. And the shock was to read this. Traditionally, Hawking said, these are questions for philosophy. But philosophy is dead. It has not kept up with modern developments in science, particularly in physics. As a result, scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. So there's your scientism. Philosophy is dead, it says on page five of the book, and the rest of the book is about philosophy. That struck me as rather strange, to say the least. Hawking's statement about philosophy is itself a philosophical statement. It's certainly not a statement of science. It blatantly contradicts itself. So, 
Scientism we can dismiss without losing any respect for science itself. But now comes the next step. Hawking's dismissal of God. I want you to listen carefully to this because it shows a deep misunderstanding that characterizes a great deal of the debate. Hawking writes, Ignorance of nature led people in ancient times to invent gods. This began to change, he suggests, with ancient Greek thinkers like Thales of Miletus about 2,600 years ago. The idea arose that nature follows consistent principles that could be deciphered. And so began, says Hawking, the long process of replacing the notion of the reign of the gods with the concept of the notion of a universe that is governed by laws of nature and created according to a blueprint we could someday learn to read. That means that Hawking is making two fundamental mistakes. Firstly, he is thinking of God or the gods as gods of the gaps. Remember a title, the Higgs boson and God of the gaps. What is this God of the gaps? Well, it's a very simple notion and it's a very important notion. It's using God as a placeholder, as a substitute for a scientific explanation. Let me give you an example. The ancient Greeks were very frightened of thunder and lightning because they thought the gods were angry. If you do some atmospheric physics and learn a little bit about electrical discharges and so on, you soon can discover that it's got nothing to do with the anger of any gods. So those gods disappear when you give a scientific explanation in terms of atmospheric physics. And so the idea is this, that when I mention God, I simply mean I can't explain it, therefore God did it. Now that is a fundamental mistake. But it's so dangerous because it leads to Hawking and many other people today not understanding what I would mean by the concept of God. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the choice that Stephen Hawking offers you and me is this. You must choose between God and science. You can't have both. And I was puzzled for a long time to understand why that choice. And then it occurred to me it's because of his concept of God. You see, if you define God to be what I can't yet explain by science, then of course you've got to choose between God and science from the way you've defined God. Now this is fascinating to me. In other words, you're giving people a choice, but the choice is between a non-existent entity and science. But what if God is not a God of the gaps, but is God of the whole show? God of the bits we do understand and the bits we don't understand. Let me put it this way. A God of the gaps thinking is very subtle. But let me put it in general. When in the days of Kepler and Newton, say the law of gravitation was discovered, that didn't mean that people said, ah, we don't need God anymore, we've got a law. No. In fact, Newton dedicated his Principia Mathematica, the most brilliant book in the history of science, which explained these laws, in the hope that the thinking person would come to believe in a deity. You see, because the idea is this, 
the more you understand of science, the more you admire the genius of the God that did it that way, not the less. But that's the way we all think. The more you know about engineering, the more you can admire a Rolls-Royce engine, not the less. The more you understand about art, the more you can admire a Rembrandt and understand it, not the less. And so therefore, I would want to emphasize that my position as a Christian is, no, not the God of the gaps. It's God is the God of the whole show. The God whom I admire more and more, the more I understand of the science of the way in which the world works. So that's the first thing to clear up. There's a false idea about God. There's another false idea about God lurking in there because he goes back to the Greek gods. Now, I do a bit of debating, as some of you know, and last year I was invited to debate at the Oxford Union. We dress up in dinner jackets and it's a parliamentary kind of debate. So the house splits and there's the opposition. So the atheists were there, including Richard Dawkins, although he didn't debate. And I and my colleagues were faced with the following argument. I was very surprised to hear it in the Oxford Union, but nonetheless, I heard it there. And the argument was this. You see, they addressed us, me, and said, you are an atheist with regard to Artemis. You don't believe in Baal. You don't believe in Zeus. You don't, and they went through a whole list. And then with a great grin they said, we just go one God more. And we dismissed Jehovah, the God of the Bible. And I thought that shows a deep misunderstanding like Hawking. Because what they're claiming is that the God of the Bible is like one of those ancient gods, but he's not. Werner Jaeger was one of the most distinguished experts in the gods of antiquity. And I'm very interested in the gods of antiquity, the Assyrian, Babylonian, Egyptian, Greek, and Roman gods. And what he says about them is very interesting. He says this, the vast difference between those gods and the God of the Bible is very simply explained. They were all descended from the universe. The God of the Bible created the universe. Now what is meant by that, descended from the universe? What's meant by that is this, that when you do some research onto the nature of those gods, you find that they, let me take one example, I think it's the Babylonian or the Egyptian, they come out of a primeval sea. That's one explanation. That is, they are ultimately material gods. They're part of the stuff of the universe. The God of the Bible is not part of the stuff of the universe. He invented the universe. And so to put God in that category is false. So there are two mistakes. And the lesson for me is this, that when I'm discussing these things in public, I need to check carefully what God we're talking about. Otherwise, we'll not make sense to each other. Now, I have mentioned the false concept of God as a God of the gaps or as a God like the Greek gods. But now let me come to false concepts of science. And here, the key word is explanation. What does it mean to explain something? What does it mean to explain something scientifically? When I was at school, I was so excited when I first found out about Newton's second law. To think that you could compress this concept of the attraction between bodies at a distance into eight symbols and deduce from that equation all the elliptical motions of the planets that Kepler had observed, to my mind was stunning. And it's something I got great joy in in my life in explaining to students. Just that sheer joy of discovering that the mathematical description worked and you could deduce all this stuff from it. But you know, I made a mistake. 
I thought, when I first met the law of gravity, that I knew what gravity was. But nobody knows what it is. You see, the law of gravity is an explanation, but it doesn't tell you what gravity is. Newton realized that. But we feel that once you've got a law, then you have explanation in its totality. That is far from the truth. What you can do, of course, and it's wonderful, is just with Newton, without Einstein, you can land a person on the moon. You can make wonderfully complex calculations, but you don't know what gravity is. Wittgenstein saw it, and he put it very well. He said, the basic deception of modernism is the illusion that the laws of nature are explanations of the phenomena of nature. They're not, they're just descriptions. Now that ought to make us humble when it comes to what we mean by explanation, but there's more to come. And the more to come is this, that Again, people are told, you've got to choose between science and God. Once you've got a scientific explanation, you don't need God. But that is to misunderstand completely what you mean by an explanation. Let me put it into another sphere. So imagine we've got a Ford motor car engine here, sitting. And I'm lecturing you on this engine. And I say, ladies and gentlemen, we're interested in explaining this engine. So I'm going to offer you two kinds of explanation. One is in terms of mechanical engineering and the law of internal combustion. The other is Henry Ford. Choose. Well, I hear some people laughing kindly. That's absurd. Now, let's think about that little bit. Because the law of internal combustion, mechanical engineering, are an explanation of that motor. So is Henry Ford. Wouldn't exist without him. But what's the difference, ladies and gentlemen? It's clear that if you want a holistic description of that engine, you must have both. And you'll notice, by the way, that they don't conflict with each other. They don't compete with each other. They complement each other. The point being that Henry Ford, who was very real, is not a scientific explanation. He's a personal agent explanation. Now, it would be ludicrous, ridiculous, and absurd for me to say, because I can explain at the level of science how that motor works in terms of mechanical engineering and the law of internal combustion. I don't need Henry Ford, thank you. That would be silly, it seems to me. It's equally silly to say, because I've got a law of gravity, because I've got the Higgs boson, because I've got this, I don't need God. Because God is not the same kind of explanation. He's no less real, of course. In fact, There'd be no universe for physicists to do physics in if God hadn't made the thing. Do we get that point? It's very important. These are simple points, actually, but they lie at the heart of a public confusion. And it's not only the general public, it's many of my scientific colleagues who don't learn to distinguish different levels of explanation that fit together. They don't compete, they don't conflict, but they give us a complementary explanation. So, go back to Lawrence Krauss's statement. The Higgs boson is arguably more important than God. My response to that was to say, for what? The Higgs boson is arguably more important than God if you're giving a lecture on subatomic physics and explaining how the particles fit in. But if the question is, how does a universe exist in which Higgs bosons come to be, then God is arguably more important than the Higgs boson. 
And uh, at the end of my article, I risked being slightly cheeky because I'm Irish, you see. And we got a sense of humor. I said, what shall we say about the Higgs boson? Well, I said, Higgs predicted it. CERN discovered it. God created it. We celebrate the first two. What about the third? And that's exactly the point. And I would want to argue that those three statements are all valid. They do not contradict one another. And that's why I'm delighted to be a scientist, because the little I understand, I understand so, so little. The little I understand just makes me rejoice because it gives me an insight into the genius of the creator that stands behind this uh, universe. Now, one of the very exciting things, now I'm very old, I gave that away. I told you I was here in 1966. I shouldn't have done that. But anyway, um, I existed a bit before that as well. <laughs> and I arrived in Cambridge in 1962. That was a very exciting time to do mathematics at Cambridge because at that time, the first evidence came in that there was a beginning to space-time, the so-called Big Bang Theory, the standard model, and the evidence was coming in. Now, here's the interesting thing. Now, virtually every scientist accepts it, but then they didn't. In fact, it was resisted, and it was resisted by some of the most distinguished scientists in England. The editor of Nature, which is the most famous scientific periodical in the world, said it is editorial. We must resist this idea of a beginning. Why? Because it will give too much support to people who believe the Bible. <laughs> now, isn't this interesting, ladies and gentlemen? I actually live to see this, that you had a major scientific advance for which Arno Penzias, amongst others, got the Nobel Prize, resisted by a scientist because it was too close to what the Bible had been saying for centuries. And I raised this with Richard Dawkins in one of our debates, and he was not impressed. <laughs> he said, look, he said, come on. He said, either it was, there was a beginning or there wasn't. There's a 50-50 chance. So what's the big deal? I said the big deal is, Richard, it wasn't settled by throwing a dice. It took massive scientific argument to get people to move away from Aristotle's view that uh, the mass energy was eternal, the universe had always existed. It took massive scientific evidence because it was resisted. These things are not settled by guesswork at all. So, contemporary science now accepts with many nuances that are very complex that there was a beginning. I had the wonderful opportunity of debating Alan Guth a couple of years ago, who's the father of inflation theory. If you don't know what that is, that's all right but it's something to do with what happened just after the Big Bang. And uh, in the audience was Alex Vilinkin, very distinguished Ukrainian, now American mathematician. And I was talking about this notion of a beginning, and he referred me to his work. And uh, it says this, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men. And a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, now this is very interesting, and he's writing it fully aware of theories of a multiverse and all of this. He says this, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic universe beginning. I find that interesting. Some people say to me, you know, the Bible is useless because it makes no predictions. Well, I suppose I understand what they mean, but I disagree with them. It tells us that there was a beginning. It's been saying it for thousands of years. 
And I'm bold enough sometimes to say to my colleagues, you know, if we'd taken it more seriously, we might have looked for evidence that there was a beginning much earlier than we did. It doesn't say a lot about science. It's not a scientific textbook. Of course it isn't. I don't teach algebra from the book of Leviticus. Nowhere. <laughs> but it does talk about the origins of our physical universe, the same universe that science is talking about. And it says there was a beginning. Now, what's fascinating about that is this. Well, it's the question we all ask. What was before that when that means anything? And now we get a chorus of people telling us that the universe came from nothing. Now, I wish now to talk about nothing. It is a very important topic, nothing. <laughs> but I warn you, I'm going to do that. But before I do, let me just give you an insight into what some of the world's leading scientists said about that beginning. It's very interesting. Alan Arno Penzias, I mentioned before, and he is just one very remarkable person. And he talks about astronomy leaving us with a singularity, a beginning, a universe from nothing with such a precise fine-tuning that one could almost say that behind it there's a supernatural plan. Alan Sandage. Alan Sandage is often regarded as the father of modern astronomy. He discovered the quasar. What did he say? He said... I find it quite improbable that such order came out of chaos. There has to be some organizing principle. God, to me, is a mystery, but is the explanation for the miracle of existence why there is something rather than nothing. And this is the question. This is a key philosophical question, much loved by philosophers. But it's very interesting. Why is it that there's something rather than nothing? And if you're driven by your physics to claim that it starts with nothing, how do you get from nothing to something? Well, I'll tell you how they do it today. They redefine nothing. Now, that to me is extremely interesting. You see, as a Christian, I believe that the universe didn't come from nothing. It came from the creative hand of God. But now if you reject the existence of an eternal God, we've got nothing at any level. And so you have to invent some way of solving it. Now, Stephen Hawking's book, the main question addressed is this question, why there's something rather than nothing. And it was when I first read his answer to this that I got extremely interested. So let me share his answer. It goes like this. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Pardon? Well, let me say it again. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. So because there is something, a law of gravity, the universe will create itself from nothing. Contradiction number one. That's astonishing, ladies and gentlemen. But it's worse still. Because there is a law of gravity, not gravity, a law of gravity, do laws create anything? Newton's laws of motion, do they move anything? Of course they don't. You see the billiard ball on the table. The law of motion doesn't move it. A cue does, hit by a person. This now opens up a window into some very profound misunderstandings. I had a, a conversation once with a very famous atheist colleague of mine, Peter Atkins, professor of physical chemistry. And I casually asked him, I said, Peter, what do you think created the universe? And without hesitation, he said mathematics. So I laughed, which perhaps wasn't the politest thing to do, but I just couldn't <laughs> help it. I, and he said, why are you laughing? I said, Peter, I am a mathematician, and that's about the silliest thing I've ever heard in my life. 
He said, why? I said, listen, two plus two equals four. Did that ever put four euros in your pocket? <laughs> Don't laugh too quickly. Some bankers believe that, you see. <laughs> you have heard of creative accounting, haven't you? And we've had a massive financial crisis precisely because some people believed that by creating sophisticated, abstract, mathematical financial systems, you could create money. But that's another topic for another time. I wouldn't risk going down that road. But you get the point, ladies and gentlemen. Two plus two equals four. Well, if you've got two euros and two euros, you've got four. But it won't give you the euros. Because laws are generally of this form. If you have A, then you'll get B. But you've got to get A first. That's very simple stuff. So I'm staggered to read this, but it's worse still. The universe can and will create itself. Well now, suppose I say to you, X creates Y. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you have X, then you get Y. So if I say X creates X, what does that mean? Well, it says if I have X, then I'll get X. Well, nonsense. <laughs> that is sheer nonsense. And what does that prove? It proves, ladies and gentlemen, that nonsense remains nonsense, even if a high-powered physicist <laughs> is talking it. Now, I'm not meaning to mock my colleagues. What staggers me is the absurdity to which they go to avoid the obvious. Krauss, to quote him again, has this sentence in his book, because something is physical. Nothing must be physical, especially if it's defined as the absence of something. Pardon? Because something is physical. Nothing must be physical, especially if it's defined as the absence of something. That's nonsense, of course. Philosophical, common sense nonsense. What's the problem? The problem is the desperate drive to get something for nothing. And now the new expedient is to redefine nothing. Now, nothing, I mentioned to you, I was uh, debating Alan Guth in a very friendly fashion in MIT in the faculty club. And I took the liberty of saying, Alan, I've got a question for you. I said, there's a lot of confusion in many people's minds about what you cosmologists are saying. Because the word nothing to us ordinary people means absence of something. If I say I went down the street in Ljubljana and I saw nobody, it does not mean I saw somebody called nobody. It means I didn't see anybody. <laughs> Your English is very impressive. <laughs> you see. You don't mean that. You don't mean that the universe started in absence of anything no, he says, we do not. What we mean is something like a quantum vacuum, which is certainly not nothing. I said, thank you very much. So, here's a book. Here are arguments that are supposed to abolish God that couldn't abolish God even if they were true, but they are based on a series of false assumptions and assertions, not only false but meaningless. They don't even rise to the dignity of being false. What am I to do with that? What am I to do with that? Well, I'm concerned about it because not every statement by a scientist is a statement of science. And the authority of science is such. I was moved to write a book on this topic by a young man who got some petrol in his car and there was a newspaper article. Stephen Hawking says there's no God. And he was physically shaken 
He was in his early 20s. And he wrote to me and he said, Who am I, little me? If Stephen Hawking says there's no God, what hope have I of being right? Ladies and gentlemen, I may get many things wrong. But I do want to step into this arena and point out, as I did to that young man, that it's not as it seems to be. There are very powerful arguments for the existence of God. Now, I'm going to finish by making another point. It is a major point, but I'm going to make it briefly. Because... One of the things that's happened in science is, A, it's been very successful, but B, it has left out the mind that's doing the science. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it starts, oddly enough, with Charles Darwin, who had a famous doubt. And he was doubting the powers of the human mind because, as he suggested, uh, the human mind, he believed, was descended from lower animal minds. And he put it this way. With me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Now think about that for a moment. I do science with my mind. What is my mind? Well, the reductionist atheist says my mind is my brain, full stop. Okay? What is my brain, I ask him? Well, my brain is the end product of a mindless, unguided process. And why would I trust it then? I mean, if you knew that your computer that you use every day was the end product of a mindless, unguided process. You wouldn't use it, would you? Now, this problem has been addressed and is currently being addressed philosophically, not simply by Christian philosophers, but by atheist philosophers. And a book has dropped like a bomb in circles in America and around the world just recently. It's by a very eminent American philosopher called Thomas Nagel. Thomas Nagel's an atheist. He doesn't want there to be a God, and he's honest about it. But let me tell you the title of his book. I've never seen a more provocative title, not this century or last century. It's this, Mind and Cosmos. Why? the neo-Darwinian view of the universe is almost certainly false. He's been accused of being a heretic. There's a huge internet discussion about him. But you can't dismiss Thomas Nagel too readily. And his point is very easy to make. It's Darwin's point. He says, if the mental is not itself merely physical, it cannot be fully explained by physical science. That's a simple point, isn't it? Naturalism, that philosophy, implies that we shouldn't take any of our convictions seriously, including the scientific world picture on which evolutionary naturalism itself depends. Let me put that another way, because it's so important. This is Alvin Plantinga, another distinguished American philosopher. If Dawkins is right, he says that we are the product of mindless, unguided processes, then he has given a strong reason to doubt the reliability of human cognitive faculties and therefore, inevitably, to doubt the validity of any belief that they produce, including Dawkins' own science and his atheism. Now, here comes the point. Listen very carefully to this. His biology on the one hand, and his belief in naturalism would therefore appear to be at war with each other in a conflict that has nothing at all to do with God. Putting that briefly, it's saying this. The theory 
that the mind is the brain, is the end product of mindless, unguided processes, undermines the whole of science. It is a philosophy that doesn't only shoot itself in the foot, it shoots itself in the head. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, I must say it's one of my major arguments for not being an atheist. Let me conclude by thinking again of these two major worldviews. They are diametrically opposed. The one says, in the beginning, well, nothing, a quantum vacuum, mass energy, whatever. And everything else is derivative from that beginning. There's no transcendence. There's no guiding mind. So it all comes from whatever was there in the beginning, plus nothing. The other worldview goes like this. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. All things came to be through Him. And without Him, nothing came to be that came to be. In the naturalistic worldview, mass energy is primary. Everything else, mind and person, is derivative. In the other worldview, mind is primary. The logos, the word, God. And everything else is derivative. And ladies and gentlemen, it is not only as a Christian but as a scientist that I prefer the biblical explanation to the atheist one. Thank you very much indeed.